On behalf of Department of English, Baba Gulam Shah Bajja University and Government Arts and Commerce College, College Netrang Bharuj, Gujarat, we welcome uh, the participants to the plenary session of three-day international conference on reading William Shakespeare. Today is the first day of this conference and we are here in the plenary session. We have with us uh, Dean Academic Affairs, Baba Gulam Shabad Shah University, Professor Iqbal Purvez. We are waiting uh, for uh, Honorable Vice Chancellor, Baba Gulam Shabad Shah University to join us. He may be with us within no time. Uh, I would uh, like to go over to uh, Professor Iqbal Purvez, Dean Academic Affairs, Baba Gulam Shabad Shah University, if he deems it fit to start the program to give a welcome address to the participants and the keynote speaker of the evening uh, here in India, Professor Paul Budra. Thank you, Tanvir, and uh, good evening and welcome to all the participants to this three-day international e-conference on revisiting William Shakespeare, which is being organized by the Department of English, uh, uh, Baba Ulam Shah Basha University, Rajori. And uh, this is... Uh, a place uh, to the people who have not uh, known about Baba Gulam Shah Basha University and have not known about this particular place. I must tell you that this is a place which is located in the region of Peer Panjal, which is a beautiful picturesque uh, zone of uh, this part of the world. And those of you who have not visited this, this place, I must tell, uh, tell them that they are really missing something great. So if and when they, they have time, I urge them all to visit this place. And when they come here, they must visit Baba Ulam Shah Basha University, which is a young upcoming university with almost all the disciplines which are being taught here. And over the last few years, this university has really made its mark in the academic arena. And uh, this period of COVID, uh, you know, pandemic period, uh, the university has kept itself busy with all kinds of academic activities. We have been buzzing with all kinds of webinars and conferences. And the one that you see here is uh, one of those conferences in that series, which is being organized by the Department of English, which is playing a very pivotal role in this. And uh, in this regard, and I think I must compliment the organizers for having taken this initiative to organize this conference. Um, I am particularly delighted to compliment uh, Mr. Tanveer main organizer of this conference, but the mention also must be made of the mentor who has made this conference possible, Dr. Romina Rashid, who is also the head department of English of Baba Gulam Shah Basha University. Uh, I am sure that this conference is going to be uh, a wonderful one. We have Most a very eminent speaker. Am I, being, uh, am, I, am I audible? Uh, Yes, sir. You are. You are audible, sir. You are. All right. All right. All right. So uh, uh, this inaugural session will have a very important keynote address by a very eminent uh, professor, Professor Paul Budra. He is uh, from the Department of English and Director SFU Publications, Simon Fraser University, Canada. He is going to talk about uh, revisiting Shakespeare in an age of conspiracy. Uh, this is, uh, seems to be a very uh, interesting topic, and I'm sure the audience all across are really going to enjoy this. So welcome you all uh, once again, and I, I'll now hand over the, you know, the, the, the mic on to Mr. Tanveer for carrying out the proceedings. Thank you, sir. Uh, I, I would like to go over to uh, Dr. Romina Rashid, Head Department of English, Baba Gulam Shah Bajcha University, to introduce uh, keynote speaker of the day, Professor Paul Budra. Uh, Dr. Romina Rashid. Uh, can hello. Yes. Hello. Am I audible? Yes. You yes. are. Good evening and a warm welcome to all the dignitaries, members of teaching fraternity, and all the participants who are connected with us through this virtual mode. 
as Shakespeare has rightly said, sweet are the uses of adversity. The Department of English Baba Gulam Shah Badsha University is utmost proud and humble of the fact that in these adverse times, when everything has come to a standstill, we have tried to connect to diverse people across the globe. It is because of the efforts of our organizing committee and encouragement and appreciation from our Honorable Vice Chancellor, Professor Javed Musarrat, that we are organizing a three-day international e-conference in collaboration with the Department of English of Government Arts and Commerce College, Natrang Baruch, Gujarat, on the topic Revisiting Shakespeare. I'm sure this academic discourse would benefit our teaching fraternity, scholars, and our students. It is my proud privilege and honor to introduce our keynote speaker of this conference, Professor Paul Budra. Professor Paul Budra is a professor of English at Simon Fraser University, Canada, where he teaches Shakespeare and early modern literature. He has published six books and numerous articles on Renaissance literature and contemporary popular culture. He is a past chair of the Department of English, a former associate dean of the arts and social sciences, and he has served as the president of the Pacific Northwest Renaissance Society. He is the winner of SFU Excellence in Teaching Award 2004, and at present, he is the director of SFU Publications. Professor Paul Budra delivers a series of public lectures at Van Quas Bad on the Beach Shakespeare every summer. The topic on which Professor Budra will be speaking is revisiting Shakespeare in Age of Conspiracies. Since times immemorial, human beings were fascinated with conspiracies. Shakespeare lived in an era where conspiracies were hashed against monarchs who reigned during his times. I would like to quote from a few lines from Shakespeare's play Macbeth. Be loin metalled proud and take no care, who shapes, who frets, or where conspirers are. Now, without much delay, let's hear from Professor Budra how Shakespeare's plays have dealt with conspiracies. Professor Budra, I welcome you. Thank you very much for accepting our invitation. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Rashid, and thank you to the organizers of the conference. Uh, can you hear me? Yes, yeah, sir, can. I can hear you. Okay, great. Uh, then I, I guess I'll start. So uh, this conference is called Revisiting the Works, uh, Revisiting William Shakespeare. And of course, why revisit the works of William Shakespeare? It's not like he's gone away. Uh, he's the most popular dramatist in the world. There are Shakespeare festivals in almost every major city in North America. He's the most popular screenwriter of all time. His plays have been adapted into movies since 1899. There's an entire academic industry dedicated to him. I know I'm part of it. The Shakespeare Association of America's annual conference attracts 1,400 scholars a year. So if we're going to revisit Shakespeare in any way, it should be for a specific reason. What can Shakespeare tell us about our current condition? What can revisiting Shakespeare tell us about ourselves at this moment in time? And I think the answer to that is, of course, many things. But I'm going to narrow it down to one thing in this talk. <clears throat> I want to talk about what Shakespeare can tell us about conspiracy, because we live in an age of conspiracy theories. Conspiracy theories have come to dominate the news. It's hard to keep track. There are conspiracy theories about the coronavirus, vaccinations, 9-11, school shootings, airplane vapor trails. A man named Mike Hughes recently died while trying to prove that the earth was flat by flying to the edge of space in a homemade rocket on the assumption that scientists, geographers, map makers, pilots, and astronauts have for centuries conspired to lie about the shape of the planet. The politics of the United States have become corrupted by the influence of conspiracy theories often approved at the highest level. In February, President Donald Trump awarded the Medal of Freedom 
to the radio host and conspiracy theorist Rush Limbaugh, a man who recently argued that the coronavirus was weaponized by the Chinese government specifically to attack Donald Trump. Now, conspiracy theories are not new. Historians have traced them back in ancient Egypt and Rome. <clears throat> More recently, they surround the assassination of John F. Kennedy, uh, the moon landing, just to name a few. But they seem to have accelerated and spread thanks almost entirely to the internet. Uh, later this weekend, try this experiment. Go home, open up Google, and type in any random noun followed by the word conspiracy, and something will show up. I tried it, I put in the word dog, dog. And I got a series of conspiracy theories about Barack Obama's dog. <clears throat> Need to interrupt yes. a minute. Now, this is not to say that there are not real conspiracies. Powerful people have tried to affect history through Candlestein back channels, sometimes with success. But what I'm interested in is what philosopher Brian Keeley calls unwarranted conspiracy theories, such as the bizarre and toxic QAnon theories that have uh, convinced some people in the United States that there is a worldwide cabal of Satan worshiping pedophiles who rule the world, and they would have continued ruling the world were it not for the election of Donald Trump. Sir. Now, Yes. Uh, I would like to here like to welcome uh, um, Honorable Vice Chancellor Baba Gulam Shabacha University. He has just joined us. Uh, uh, I would welcome him to this meeting and thank you, sir. Please, you can go ahead. Okay, thank you. Uh, now, historians and sociologists and, and psychologists of political sciences, as even philosophers, have all studied conspiracy theories through different lenses. But I'm a Shakespeare scholar, I'm a literary critic, so I would like to look at conspiracy through that lens to critique conspiracies as a literary genre to see if we can come up with any generalizations about them as a narrative form, which is a bit tricky because many of these conspiracy theories are never written down in a single coherent document. It's also tricky because it's a huge topic. So I'm gonna focus on three things. One of the drivers of conspiracy theories, their primary literary device and their narrative form. And I'm doing this by revisiting Shakespeare. And I think this makes sense for a couple of reasons. First of all, uh, Shakespeare himself lived in an era of real conspiracy, as was mentioned. There were three major plots to assassinate Queen Elizabeth, the last of which, the Babington plot, had the support of Mary Queen of Scots and ended up costing her her head. There were a number of plots to assassinate King James I, the most famous of which was the Gunpowder Plot of 1605 in which Catholics came very close to blowing up the parliament buildings and killing the royal family. That miraculous rescue is still celebrated in England on November 5th, Guy Fawkes Day. Second, Shakespeare represents conspiracies in his plays, and some are based on actual historical events. The short-lived plot against Henry V in the play by that title. And of course, one of the most famous and successful conspiracies in Western history the plot to assassinate Julius Caesar. Shakespeare also invented conspiracies, many of them funny. The plot against Falstaff at Gad's Hill in Henry IV Part I. The plot against Malvolio in Twelfth Night. The third and most important, of course, is the fact that Shakespeare is one of the few world authors, maybe the only world author, about whom conspiracy theories have circulated. As I'll outline shortly, since the mid 19th century, a number of the people have proposed that Shakespeare was a pseudonym or a stand in for another writer or writers. This past year, I was contacted by two men independently of each other, both of whom told me they could prove that William Shakespeare of Stratford upon Avon did not write the poems and plays of William Shakespeare. The first man, uh, Alan Tarica, told me he had scientifically proven that William Shakespeare did not write the plays or sonnets of Shakespeare. They were, according to Mr. Tereka, written by the 17th Earl of Oxford, Edward de Vere. And the scientific method he employed to reach this conclusion was to read Shakespeare's sonnet sequence backwards. As he explains in his Twitter feed from 2015, quote, I have given Shakespeare's sonnets clear and unambiguous authorial intention. There is only one way to read them and other ways are clearly wrong." End quote. 
The other gentleman, uh, Alan Bacino, had written a novel about Christopher Marlowe, the real poet and playwright who was murdered in 1593. In the novel, Marlowe doesn't die. Instead, he fakes his own death and writes under the name William Shakespeare. Uh, and although this is presented as a novel, uh, Mr. Bacino says it's based entirely on historical facts. Now, before we go any further, let me say I'm not going to spend uh, a lot of time trying to debunk these conspiracy theories about Shakespeare. I'll mention them by ways of illustration, but that's not my purpose here tonight. Um, I don't really want to talk about that for two reasons. Uh, first of all, it has been done. Scholars such as James Shapiro and even Lee Mathis and Paul Edmondson have dealt with these arguments. Shapiro details the history and growth of the conspiracy theories. Mathis and Edmondson do excellent jobs of showing how the conspiracy theorists have distorted and edited the historical record in support of their theories. And I'd be happy to point you toward their books. And second, and this brings me to the first defining feature of conspiracy theories in general. Anything I would say won't matter to the conspiracy theorists because conspiracy theories are tautological. They are circular. For the conspiracy theorist, the lack of any evidence to support his theory is itself proof of the theory. It means that the true facts, the real story have been covered up, hidden, the evidence suppressed or destroyed. Second, any historical documents or facts that contradict the proposed conspiracy are themselves thought to be part of the conspiracy. They have been planted. They are part of a clever smokescreen to hide the truth. True facts, the so, real story has been covered up. So let's try a small thought experiment using Shakespeare. Let us imagine that a 16th century document is discovered tomorrow. And it says, hey, everyone knows that Shakespeare was a front for the Earl of Oxford and a whole bunch of us theater companies and theater owners and fellow playwrights and printers and rivals and friends and fans, we all colluded to hide the fact. If that document showed up, I would be flabbergasted, but I would immediately begin to reassess all that I know about theatrical practice and authorship in Elizabethan England. I would have to as a scholar, that's my job. But let's imagine that a 16th century document shows up that lists Shakespeare as one of the living successful dramatists of the Elizabethan stage and lists, say, the Earl of Oxford as another dramatist in the pantheon of writers in that period, a distinct and separate author. Or let's imagine a 17th century document shows up that talks about the living author Shakespeare this year is after the death of the Earl of Oxford and Christopher Marlowe. Or imagine we have private notes and book marginalia that mention Shakespeare as a writer or reminiscences about him from his friends. In all those cases, the conspiracy theorists will explain the documents away as part of the cover-up. I know that to be true because all those documents I just mentioned and many more exist and the conspiracy theorists have rationalized them away. So let us begin by briefly looking at the conspiracy theories about Shakespeare's authorship. Uh, those two men, Tarika and Bacino, have helped me introduce two conspiracy theories about Shakespeare, that he was really Edward de Vere, the 17th Earl of Oxford, or he was the poet and playwright Christopher Marlowe. Other candidates for the real Shakespeare have included a group of politicians, Sir Walter Raleigh, Edmund Spencer, Sir Francis Bacon, William Stanley, 6th Earl of Derby, Roger Manners, 5th Earl of Rutland, Mary Sidney, Edward Dyer, William Nugent, Henry Neville, the Irishman Patrick O'Toole of Ennis, the Italian Michelangelo Florio, Amelia Lanier, and Queen Elizabeth I. The late Muammar Gaddafi argued that Shakespeare was really an Arab named Sheikh Sabar. Now, where does all this come from? Atlanta Boyum has argued that conspiracy theories flourish at a time of crisis, of political and social change. I'm not sure I agree. The conspiracy theories about Shakespeare and many of the conspiracy theories we see today seem not so much the product of an immediate crisis, but rather a failure of imagination. And this may sound counterintuitive because so many conspiracy theories are wildly fanciful and imaginative. But the failure I'm talking about is an inability 
or willful disinclination to think beyond one's own preconceptions, experience, or culture. Responding instead to the exceptional, the foreign, or inexplicable with disbelief. A disbelief that can turn into a paranoia that imposes patterns, sometimes very fanciful, on reality. Patterns that are sometimes presumed to be the product of some controlling agent. So let us look at the conspiracy theories around Shakespeare. The first full articulation of these theories came in the 19th century. And to understand their genesis, as to understand the genesis of any conspiracy theory with critical mass, as opposed to those that are just a paranoid delusion of an individual, we have to understand the culture and the specific failures of imagination that generated them. And there were three main cultural drivers behind the Shakespeare conspiracy theory. Romanticism, bardolatry, and autobiography. Romanticism was an artistic and intellectual movement that caught on at the end of the 18th century. It was a reaction against the rationality of the enlightenment and it emphasized the emotional, the natural and artistic genius. And the latter is the important thing. The emphasis on the artist as the creative genius, genius unshackled by traditions and conventions, born, not trained. William Wordsworth, the great romantic poet said, quote, what is a poet? He is a man speaking to men, a man, it is true, endued with more lively sensibility, more enthusiasm and tenderness, who has a greater knowledge of human nature and a more comprehensive soul than are supposed to be common among mankind, end quote. So you see, the artist is an exceptional individual. He's not a skilled craftsman. He is someone who is profoundly different. And this idea is still very much with us. The Romantics saw in Shakespeare a prototype of themselves, the natural genius unfettered by stultifying education and training. And by the way, the idea that Shakespeare was incredibly learned is a relatively new one. Shakespeare in his time and the centuries immediately after was celebrated as a poet of nature and love, not learning, not scholarship. Shakespeare's contemporary, Ben Jonson, made fun of Shakespeare's lack of learning, his small Latin and less Greek. John Milton called Shakespeare fancy's child, that is the poet of imagination rather than learning, who warbled his quote, wood notes wild. So an untutored genius, a natural born genius like the romantics themselves. The rise of romanticism occurred at the same time that bardolatry, the worship of Shakespeare began reaching a peak in the mid 19th century, the Victorian period. There's a number of things that fueled this. The actor and theatrical impresario David Garrick promoted the genius of Shakespeare for financial reasons and held a Shakespeare Jubilee in Stratford-upon-Avon in 1769. Shakespeare was useful because he had written so much. He was a source of quotable wisdom and this made him into a secular moral authority. He had royalist tendencies, which in an age of revolution, the British celebrated and exported across their empire, including to countries like India. He was also long dead, so you could stage his plays for free. So by 1840, Thomas Carlyle could write an essay called The King Shakespeare. Shakespeare, he said, Shakespeare is the chief of all poets hitherto, the greatest intellect who in our recorded world has left record of himself in the way of literature, King Shakespeare. So you have the romantic concept of the artist as a great man, a special breed, combined with the assumption that Shakespeare was the greatest artist of all time. That meant that Shakespeare was the greatest man, someone who should have left a trail of glory through history. But that's not what the historical record shows. It shows a middle-class country boy who worked very, very hard immersed himself in the world of theater, stuck with the same theatrical company for years, which was unusual, was careful with money, and then retired rich. It's not very romantic. 
especially the idea of writing for money, which many found irreconcilable with their image of King Shakespeare, the dispenser of universal truths. The third factor was the rise of autobiography in the 19th century. There was no real autobiographical literature in Shakespeare's time. About all you will find in terms of autobiography is a handful of spiritual diaries. The word autobiography was not invented until 1797. But by the end of the 19th century, Oscar Wilde could say, quote, we live in an age when men treat art as if it were meant to be a form of autobiography, end quote. People, especially critics, came to assume that literature was necessarily autobiographical, and many writing, writers were happy to plumb their own lives for source material. That idea would have been crazy in Shakespeare's time. The plays of Elizabethan theater, the plays of Shakespeare, were based almost entirely on existing stories, not playwrights' lives. So these three movements combine to create a set of preconceptions that the Victorians assumed were universal truths about art and artists. And some people simply could not imagine an alternative. Those people could not imagine Shakespeare as a diligent middle-class craftsman. They could not imagine him as an uninteresting person. And they could not imagine him not writing about himself. Their imaginations failed to accommodate another model of artistic creation. So an alternative narrative, one that fit their preconceptions, was needed. Shakespeare must have been a great man who, for some reason, disguised his identity under the pseudonym Shakespeare or used the real Shakespeare as a patsy. We just have to read his plays and poems to figure out who he is, because all literature is autobiographical, right? Everyone knows that. The first person to make a prolonged case for this idea was one Delia Bacon, who argued that Shakespeare's work were in fact written by Sir Francis Bacon, no relation, the English philosopher and statesman. And this theory was popular for some decades and was propped up by elaborate readings of secret codes and anagrams in Shakespeare's works. The next and most enduring theory was proposed by a man called Thomas Looney, and I love his last name, in 1920. He did not find any recorded facts or historical documents that suggested that anyone except William Shakespeare of Stratford-upon-Avon wrote the plays and poems. There aren't any. Rather, he took it as an article of faith that Shakespeare would have to have been a greater more exciting man. And he sat down and he wrote up a list of attributes that he believed Shakespeare must have had. In other words, he created a god in his own image. He then looked into Elizabethan history to find someone who he thought fit the image he had created. And he stumbled on Edward de Vere, the 17th Earl of Oxford. And he said, that's my man. The vast number of impossibilities for this attribution not the least of which was the death of De Vere's in 1604, Shakespeare keeps writing plays until 1613, were dismissed. What was important was Looney thought he could trace in Shakespeare's plays references to the events and circumstances of De Vere's own life. His argument, and the argument of his followers to this day, not the least of which is Mr. Alan Tarica, who wrote to me, is that plays and poems are a disguised autobiography. Which brings me back to conspiracy theories uh, as a type of literature. The dominant literary device that conspiracy theorists employ is allegory. Now, a quick reminder, an allegory is a narrative in which characters and events consistently refer to another set of characters and events or ideas. And the most famous example in the 20th century would be George Orwell's novel, Animal Farm which tells the story of a group of farm animals taking control of the farm in which they live, but the various animal characters and events refer to the characters and events of the Russian Revolution. The longest allegorical poem in the English language, Edmund Spencer's The Fairy Queen, was published in Shakespeare's lifetime. In this epic poem, knights representing different virtues go on a series of adventures that test them. 
So for example, the Red Cross Knight who represents holiness must battle error and pride. People who write allegories want their readers to get it. That's the whole point, to teach and delight. But allegories don't just teach and delight. There's a long tradition of using allegorical reading to understand the world. And you find that tradition in religion. Many religions read their holy texts and human history itself as an allegory. Certain parts of the Bible, especially the more confusing ones like the book of Revelations, have long been interpreted as allegories, often with the aim of predicting an impending apocalypse. And indeed, the Bible is full of allegories. Christ's parables are small allegories. This resorting to allegorical reading is necessary because most religions hold their sacred texts to be inviolable, perfect, the word of God or one of his prophets. If there are things that are not clear in the religious text, then they must be symbolic or allegorical. Now further, many believers read history allegorical, allegorically, believing that if we but read human events correctly, we can see the revealed plan of God. History is a sort of denying conspiracy and unfolding revelation of God's purpose, his plan, his preordained narrative. So history is a type of allegory the religious text may be read allegorically and they support each other. What conspiracy theorists in general argue is that the received narrative of an event such as 9-11 or the moon landing, the official story is not the real story. The received narrative points to the real underlying narrative that they as expert critics see. The Shakespeare conspiracy theorists come close to religion's use of allegory in that they read two types of allegory. First, they read the conventional historical accounts of the Elizabethan court and theater as a sort of cover story. And second, they read Shakespeare's works allegorically as a form of disguised autobiography, as I mentioned. So let me, let me give you a very quick and short example. In Shakespeare's play, King Lear, the king has three daughters. The Earl of Oxford, Edward de Vere, had three daughters. Coincidence or autobiography? Now, again, this does ignore the fact that almost all of Shakespeare's plays are based on existing stories. And there were stories and plays about King Lear and his three daughters well before Shakespeare's play of that name. And please note, there, there were allegorical plays in Shakespeare's lifetime but they were clearly allegorical. Morality plays like every man, which has a character named every man who meets a character named death and is told he has to go on a journey. Very clear allegory. The biggest theatrical blockbuster of the English Renaissance was a play called A Game at Chess by Thomas Middleton and his friends. It was an allegorical, and satirical treatment of England's failed policies against Spain during the reign of James I. It is not subtle. Everyone who attended it knew what the allegory meant and the authorities eventually shut it down. But there are no allegorical plays about authors' lives in this period. There simply aren't any. Bardolatry made Shakespeare's writings in particular susceptible to this sort of almost biblical interpretation. As I mentioned, King Shakespeare was held up as a moral authority and not just a moral authority. The word most often used to describe Shakespeare in the 19th century was divine, the divine William Shakespeare. And in the 19th century and beyond, Shakespeare's plays were treated the way religions treat their sacred texts, as inviolable and perfect. Any errors or inconsistencies in the text were dismissed as the mistakes made by printers. Some critics even dismissed entire plays, like Shakespeare's Titus Andronicus, as the work of someone other than the divine Shakespeare. The divine Shakespeare could not have written that bloody mess of a play. And if you haven't read Titus Andronicus, which was very popular when it was first produced, read it tonight. It is a play full of, of incredible violence. And so for centuries, even the most rigorous of Shakespeare's critics and editors 
could not conceive of Shakespeare, for example, revising his plays or letting them exist in more than one version or of him collaborating with other authors. They assume the romantic model of artistic creation, a solitary author channeling his genius to create perfect artistic objects. So Shakespeare's texts were sort of secular scripture, their perfection, a matter of faith. And I don't think it's a coincidence that the two first Shakespeare conspiracy theories were religious people. Delia Bacon was a fervent Puritan. Mr. Looney belonged to a cult called the Religion of Humanity, a branch of a positivist movement begun by the French philosopher Auguste Comte. And this movement exalted Shakespeare as, quote, one of the teachers of mankind. They literally worshipped Shakespeare. So a secular, a secular scripture meets an allegorical reading to create an all-encompassing narrative that is supported by circular logic. That's conspiracy theory in a nutshell. And all-encompassing is the important thing here. As the American thinker Richard Hofstetter recognized back in 1964, quote, the paranoid mentality is far more coherent than the real world since it leaves no room for mistakes or ambiguities, end quote. Or as Michael Barkin has noted for the conspiracy theorists, quote, nothing happens by accident. Conspiracy implies a world based on intentionality from which accident and coincidence have been removed. Anything happens, happens because it has been willed, end quote. For the conspiracy theory, there is no room for confusion or chaos or for simple human indolence. The contingencies of everyday existence are not acknowledged. For some Shakespeare conspiracy theorists, this means drilling down to textual minutiae. Numerous theorists, beginning with Helia Bacon, have looked for anagrams and secret symbols and other coded messages in Shakespeare's texts, circling letters, looking for variant spellings, counting words. And this totally ignores the slapdash nature of early modern printing practices. To generate an allegorical reading of someone like Shakespeare, about whom so much has been written, conspiracy theories have to generate an allegory that is incredibly complicated, that accounts for every detail in the original narrative, often with paranoid obsession, and which expands every time a new fact or reference is discovered because it has to be fit into the reading and be explained away. And so the alternative narratives that the allegorical readings generate become increasingly complex, convoluted, and granular. But no matter how complex and evolved they are, how extended these allegories in their drive to solve everything, to sew it up neatly and put a bow on it, they are, I would argue, paradoxically reductionist. Which brings me to the second point about conspiracy theories as a type of literature. If we are to think of conspiracy theories as literature, they are at best genre fiction. And by genre fiction, I mean those books and other narratives that follow, follow a simple and well-established set of conventions. Think of mystery novels or romance novels. Um, I don't know if it's true in India, but in North America, bookstores have this built into their organization. If you go into a North American bookstore, there is a section called fiction, or sometimes called fiction and literature. And that's where the serious literature is stored. And then there are these other sections, mystery, romance, horror, science fiction, fantasy. That's the genre fiction. And this itself, is, it's not a bad thing. Genre fiction can be very entertaining. Genre fiction is among some of the most popular narratives in the world. Who doesn't love a good mystery? I do. But there is a reason those books aren't in the literature section. None of them are great literature. Few of them are. None of them reveals new layers of meaning on subsequent readings. None of them contains shades of ambiguity. These books are formulaic. They offer a simple theme, a simple storyline, and the good ones do it very well. 
they are entertaining his narratives because they present and solve a mystery or they're salacious or they speak to something in the cultural moment, but they aren't in the literature section. Now, the specific literary, literary genres that conspiracy theories or theorists seem to invoke is the thriller or the mystery. Those novels and movies in which a protagonist engages with large and malevolent forces that threaten his life, or the protagonist solves some mystery by examining obscure clues that everyone else has failed to recognize. And the rhetoric of the Shakespeare conspiracy theorists, if you go to their websites, suggests that they do see themselves as modern Sherlock Holmes. But, but here's the problem with the conspiracy theorists, the Shakespeare conspiracy theorists. In their interpretive zeal, they impose the simple genre conventions of the mystery or the thriller upon Shakespeare's writing itself. They reduce Shakespeare's plays and poems to <clears throat> a mystery novel. They read Shakespeare's plays as a veiled autobiography of a dashing courtier negotiating the cutthroat politics of the Elizabethan court. As for the sonnets, they read them backwards and you get a version of Oxford's autobiography. They reduce Shakespeare's writing to a puzzle. They solve it. They turn it into an Agatha Christie novel, revealing the hidden clues and shouting, aha, got you. <clears throat> Let me give you a very simple example of this. The Oxford enthusiasts have argued that the play Hamlet is a critique of the later Elizabethan court by an insider, the Earl of Oxford. After all, Prince Hamlet gets abducted by pirates. The Earl of Oxford was once abducted by pirates, case closed. But more specifically, the character of Polonius, the father of Ophelia, is held up to be a parody of Queen Elizabeth's most important advisor, Sir William Cecil, Lord Burley. So the character, Polonius, is supposed to be an allegory of Sir William Cecil. The fact that supports this theory is that Cecil's nickname was, the theorists tell us, Polus. Polus, the Latin word for heaven. What kind of nickname is Polus? Queen Elizabeth did give out nicknames to her courtiers. Uh, the uh, Earl of Essex was called the Gypsy because of his dark complexion. Sir William Cecil was called the Fox because he was smart. But Polus? The source for this is supposed to be four Latin tracts written by Gabriel Harvey in the 16th century, the third of which is addressed to Cecil. In it, Harvey is supposed to have called Cecil Polus, his secret nickname. Now, I studied Latin in high school, but my Latin is not good at all. But I, I went and I found that track, that Latin track, and read it and found something very interesting. The word polis, the word polis doesn't appear in it at all. The theorists just lied, but they persist. And so Hamlet, one of the richest and most resonant pieces of literature in the Western tradition, a work radical in its foregrounding of a human consciousness struggling to make sense of an endlessly complex world is really an allegory and critique of Queen Elizabeth's court that they have solved. You just have to accept a lie about Polonius's name. Not only his works, but Shakespeare's life can be solved. Missing years, ambiguities about his family, writing knowledge, we've got the answer. Just plug in another person, rearrange a huge number of dates and references, and you have a solution. Shakespeare's genius is not mysterious because he was a well-educated and traveled nobleman writing about his own life and court, solved. Everything that distinguishes great literature, ambiguity, the ineffable, plurality, subtlety is pushed aside. Everything that surprises us about the human condition can be explained by exposing the conspiracy. That's what I mean by reductionism. Now, compare this to how Shakespeare depicts conspiracies in his plays. In Henry V, just before King Henry is to launch his war on France, a conspiracy against him by three English noblemen is discovered. Henry arrests and confronts the traitors. He is baffled by their treachery, especially that of his friend, Lord Scrope. He says this, "'Tis so strange that though the truth of it stands off as gross as black on white, my eye will scarcely see it. 
See, there's no explanation for it. Scrope had everything going for him. Showman dutiful, why so didst thou? Seem they grave and learned, why so didst thou? Come they of noble family, why so didst thou? Henry says to him, I will weep for thee, for this revolt of thine, methinks, is like another fall of man. There are, no, there are no easy answers. The conspiracy cannot be easily explained. At a certain level, it cannot be explained at all. Shakespeare refuses to reduce human beings to genre fiction cliches. <clears throat> In Julius Caesar, the conspiracy against Caesar ends up being directed by Caesar's friend, Brutus. Brutus kills Caesar based on a theoretical speculation. Caesar might become king. Now, C Brutus knows it's only a speculation, yet he helps butcher the greatest man in Rome, his friend. Yet at the end of the play, Mark Antony calls Brutus the noblest Roman of them all. And we watching the play might agree with him, depending on the production, because it's not black and white. There are no easy answers in life or in literature, but there are in mystery novels. Now, what is the attraction, the pleasure of these conspiracy narratives? I think above all, they create a sense of community. Conspiracy theorists band together, most often on the internet, into communities of belief to congratulate themselves on their insider knowledge. They believe they are special, that they, unlike everyone else, have seen through the cover story to the hidden reality. They are not one of the ignorant. Which brings me to the last ingredient that conspiracy theories in their genre fiction reduction of reality need. They need a bad guy. Remember the conspiracies of Shakespeare's age, the ones that he represents that I mentioned earlier? The conspiracies in Shakespeare and the conspiracies of his age were generated by people bent on attacking an authority figure, someone above them. The senators of Rome conspired to kill the would-be King Caesar. The British noblemen conspired to kill the King Henry V. Guy Fox came close to blowing up the royal family. Modern conspiracy theorists to a large extent represent the opposite, it is the authority figures who are conspiring against the people who have duped the populace. Now, as mentioned, the theories about Shakespeare appeared in the period where he was elevated to a sort of moral quasi-religious position. It's also at the time when English literature was beginning to emerge as an actual field of academic study. And that meant the emergence of a class of professional Shakespeare scholars who claimed a sort of authority. In the minds of the conspiracy theorists, Shakespeareans came to be imagined as a monolithic block of conspirators, intentionally misleading the public about the identity of the author of Shakespeare's works. And why would we do this? To suppress the truth, obviously. And so we, like all villains, can accrue staggering power and untold riches. So the conspiracy theories as a literary genre, substitute out the pleasures of narrative for something else, a sort of theology, a belief system that reveals the truth behind the events, describing a narrative that fits neatly into the genre section of the bookstore. And the engagement with this narrative not only grants a sense of community of being part of an elect few, it, it gives its proponents an enemy, someone to hate, me. Now, how is any of this important? So what? if conspiracy theorists read Shakespeare allegorically or try to reduce his works to mystery novels. Well, this brings us back to the failure of imagination that I see as crucial to so many conspiracy theories. As I mentioned, the failure that generated the Shakespeare conspiracies was an historical one, an inability of the 19th century theorists to understand the fundamentally different conditions of the early modern period. They assumed a trans-historical essentialism, which is in part tied to their perception of Shakespeare as the speaker of universal truths, truths that were supposed to transcend time. The conspiracy theorists looked and continue to look at events historically, but they import contemporary assumptions and cultural values into the past so they can pass judgment, a sort of corrective hindsight. Sometimes they do this with specific practices or events that are read through a contemporary lens. So conspiracy theorists love to point out that Shakespeare spelt his name different ways when he wrote his signature. That does sound suspicious, except it was entirely commonplace. Sir Walter Raleigh spelt his name four different ways. Philip Henslow, uh, the theatrical impresario, spelt his name dozens of ways in his own diary. Or how about this? 
Shakespeare's name did not appear on the first printed editions of his plays. Uh-oh, the true author must have wanted to remain anonymous. But this is true of virtually all the early published plays. No one cared about the authors in the early days of professional theater any more than you care who wrote the screenplay for your favorite episode of a television show. Shakespeare would go on to be one of the first authors whose name was regularly printed on published plays. But more often, I think more importantly, this failure of historical imagination is applied to the beliefs and values of the past. This is tricky because we often fail to recognize the cultural forces that have shaped our own belief systems. And so we can read them unthinkingly into the past. And I, I warn my students about this all the time. When I explain the strange beliefs of the past to my students, a few of them inevitably say, well, I wouldn't have believed that, that's stupid. And I always explain that by saying that, they're signaling that they are just the sort of person who would have believed it because if they're incapable of imagining anything other than what they believe at this historical moment in this culture, they would not have been able to imagine themselves out of the culture of the past had they been born there. Now, because conspiracy theorists seem incapable of accepting the past as a foreign country, this misalignment of values between our time and the past is thought to demonstrate subterfuge. So for example, conspiracy theorists jump on the fact that Shakespeare's wife and daughters were never taught to read. How could that be? The greatest writer in history didn't teach his children to read. The man who gave us Rosalind and Viola and Beatrice did not empower the women in his life? No, he didn't. And it would have been very odd if he had. Very, very few women were taught to read and write in Shakespeare's time, especially in the countryside. They didn't have the time. And Shakespeare was, at best, a long distance father spending most of his working life away from his family. Or the idea that Shakespeare's descendants 30 or 40 years after his death during the period of the English Civil War in which no plays at all were staged, may have just thrown out his old papers. Nonsense, say the conspiracy theorists, impossible. Someone must have known their significance and preserved them. Where are the precious handwritten manuscripts of his plays? Where are his letters? Almost no theatrical manuscripts from the period exist. You know what else we don't have the manuscript for from this period? The King James Bible. Now, the Shakespeare conspiracy theorist's failure of imagination is long historical lines, but there are many other conspiracy theories generated by other failures of imagination. It's the failure to understand another culture, the failure to understand someone else's values or material conditions, the failure to understand coincidence. And this is increasingly a problem. In the United States, violence has narrowly being avoided as proponents of various conspiracy theories have attempted to act on their beliefs. In comparison, the conspiracies around Shakespeare seem quaint. In the grand scheme of things, do we really care who wrote Shakespeare's plays? <clears throat> Maybe not. One of the things that recent scholarship has proven is how much of Shakespeare's works were written in collaboration with other authors, including Christopher Marlowe. Remember, he was writing before the romantic model of authorship took place. But it is important if you value literature, if you value history, if you care about the complexities and contingencies that nuance the human experience. For conspiracy theories, even ones as insignificant as the Shakespeare authorship one, flatten out reality and impose upon it a simplistic moral rhetoric, reducing reality to good guys versus bad guys, us versus them, imposing a banal but all-encompassing narrative on the messiness of lived reality and telling people to pick a side. It's no surprise that conspiracy theories are flourishing in the United States right now. That country is profoundly divided along ideological lines, and it's simply easier to explain away the intentions of the people on the other side of that divide through a conspiracy theory than it is to engage with their reality, to accept a play of ideas and look for compromise. It's easier to buy into a demonizing narrative about the other person's intentions than to imagine being them, in part because imagining the other can lead to empathy. Now, every year I attend the annual meeting of the Shakespeare Association of America, the largest annual gathering of Shakespeare scholars in the world. Picture, if you can, 1,400 Shakespeare scholars in one hotel. And at these conferences, I sit across the table from other scholars, and we disagree, sometimes profoundly, over the meaning of Shakespeare's works. What happens at the conferences? We argue. We do not agree because we are not committed to creating an orthodoxy a master narrative, an allegorical reading that solves everything, because we are not engaged with a mystery novel, something that clicks shut on the last page. Instead, we're engaged with the inexhaustible play of meaning that great art inspires. In this case, 
the creations of Shakespeare's genius, but also the talent of his collaborators, the constraints of his theatrical conditions and the contingencies of historical transmission. And perhaps this is why great literature like Shakespeare is important. That's why we revisit Shakespeare and other great art because it continually makes us imagine, imagine another time, another culture, another understanding of reality. Imagine for a few hours, what it's like to be another person. And that is our Shakespeare conspiracy. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Professor Paul Budra. We were listening to an enlightening speech on revisiting William Shakespeare in the age of conspiracy. Uh, William Shakespeare uh, is a name that we associate with English literature. English literature almost flourished only in Renaissance and William Shakespeare was key to it. And we know the famous a person, more theories there are. And Professor Paul Budra rightly mentioned all the theories that we had against uh, William Shakespeare uh, about his writings, whether he was the real author or he was not the real author, what were the intention behind his plays, how the romantics reacted to him, how people post uh, romantics are in 20th century, in 20th, 21st century reacted to William Shakespeare. There have been some theorists to even doubt whether William Shakespeare was a male or a female. So there are all these theories that we have regarding William Shakespeare. And today we had a great session wherein uh, Professor Paul Budra who was joining us straight uh, from Vancouver, Simon Fraser University. Uh, Thank you, sir. And now I would uh, like to go over uh, to Honorable Vice Chancellor, uh, Baba Gulam Shah Badshah University, Professor Javed Musarat, who has been a real force, a real inspiration for all of us to uh, give a presidential address. Over to uh, Honorable Vice Chancellor, Professor Javed Musarat. Well, thanks, Tanvir, for uh, giving me this slot to uh, express my views. Uh, audience, my dear friends, ladies and gentlemen, it is uh, uh, really a very good experience and I am uh, I'm glad that I'm attending this uh, inaugural session of a three-day international conference on revisiting William Shakespeare being organized by the Department of English, Baba Gulam Shabasha University uh, and Government Arts and uh, Commerce College, uh, Gujarat. Uh, it's uh, indeed a wonderful initiative for optimum utilization of lockdown period here in India for promotion of knowledge and revisiting English literature. I express my gratitude to Professor Paul, who is from Simon Fraser University, Canada, and uh, is an authority on uh, Shakespeare and uh, on literature and contemporary popular culture in general. I'm thankful to him for accepting our invitation. And I You're appreciate, uh, Paul, your participation in this event as a keynote speaker. You're very welcome. Thank you. For uh, you mind. have delivered a very interesting and a very powerful talk on a contemporary topic, uh, revisiting Shakespeare in age of conspiracy. I am so pleased that Baba Gulam Shah Basha University, Department of English, has played a pivotal role in engaging the students and faculty during the crisis time in acquisition of knowledge and scholarship through virtual mode. Now this department under the dynamic uh, leadership of Dr. Romina Rashid as uh, head of the department has uh, progressed leaps and bounds and exhibited a lot of creativity during this uh, COVID-19 pandemic. This three-day conference, as I understand, will cover a very wide spectrum of Shakespeare's work and deliberate on his multifaceted personality and thoughts. I perceive that uh, many of the attendees of this lecture of Professor Paul would be feeling blessed as it has stimulated 
our thrust for learning more and more about different facets of the mercurial personality of Shakespeare and his gigantic work. I'm happy and I'm told that uh, this e-conference will cover almost 13 key areas encompassing 13 sub-themes which uh, make the conference a very, very attractive and informative portal for understanding the vastness of Shakespeare's wisdom and philosophy. So I'm so glad, in fact, attending this conference. And at the end, in the words of Shakespeare, I would like to give a message to all those students who have attended this wonderful uh, lecture that for being successful in your career, you remember the message left to us uh, by Shakespeare, and that is know more than others, work more than others, and expect less than others. And once you are successful, once you succeed in your life, always remember two things, and they should be on your lips, silence and smile. And that's what the Shakespeare has said. And I stick to these two things very well. So once again, thank you very much, Paul, for spending your valuable time with us, in fact, and enlightening us on uh, different aspects of the conspiracy theory uh, during the period of uh, Shakespeare and up to 19th century. Uh, it was really a revelation to me. I'm not a student of literature, but I love literature. So once again, uh, I am grateful to you and to the organizers for organizing this three-day conference, which is going to be very, very fruitful to all the scholars who are working in this area. So thank you very much once again. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you for inviting me. And please have a wonderful conference. Uh, thank you. Thanks. We were speaking to Honorable Vice Chancellor Baba Gulam Shah Badshah University, Professor Javed Musarrat. Now I'd like to go over to uh, Professor G.M. Malik, sir. He is Dean, School of Islamic Studies, School of Languages and Islamic Studies, Baba Gulam Shah Badshah University, for a vote of thanks. Professor G.M. Malik, if you can unmute yourself. Malik, sir, if you... Uh, thank you. Thank you, Tanvir. <clears throat> thank you. Am I audible now? Sir, yes, sir, you are. It is my privilege to have been asked to propose a vote of thanks on this occasion. At the very outset, I would like to express my sincere gratitude and thanks to our Honorable Vice Chancellor, Professor <coughs> Javid Masarat, for his vibrant leadership, encouragement, guidance, support, and inspiration. Oh, thanks a lot. To organize such extension lectures on webinar, seminars, workshops for the benefit of our students, scholars, and faculty. It is my candid objective observation on the basis of my four decade experience of universities in India and abroad that institutions of higher learning can never become vibrant can never progress unless these institutions are headed by eminent academicians who have vision, mission, and are forward-looking. Baba Gulam Shabatsha University is very fortunate for having Professor Masarat Javid as Vice Chancellor. And this young university is blooming under the vibrant and dynamic leadership of Professor Javed Masarat. We are thankful to you, sir. You're most welcome, sir. Thanks. I extend my thanks to Dean Academic Affairs, Professor Iqbal Parvez, who is an eminent scientist, academician, and an able administrator. He has always been a great support to us in organizing such webinar. I am thankful to you, sir, and you are, you are present today also in our webinar. My pleasure, sir. My pleasure. My thanks, special thanks to Dr. Tanispat Bai Parmar, Principal and Professor Jason Rathur, Head Department of English, Government Arts and Commerce College, Natrang, 
Baruch Gujarat for collaborative venture with the Department of English, Baba Gulam Shabbat Shah, University. Thank you, sir. Thank you. My sincerely heartfelt gratitude to our keynote speaker of today, Professor Paul Kudra, Department of English, Simon Fraser University, Canada. Sir, your wonderful note address has added to our knowledge on Shakespeare. It is an acknowledged fact that the greatness of a great author lies in the fact that his creation surpasses time and space. Your presentation has demonstrated that Shakespeare could be studied in any age and irrespective of culture and country. Once again, I thank you, Professor Paul, for being with us this evening. It has been a great pleasure. We are all inspired by your great words. Thank you, Professor Paul. You're most welcome. Thank you for inviting me. In the end, I would like to express that an event like this cannot be, cannot happen overnight. The wheel start rolling weeks ago. It requires planning and a bird's eye for details. We have been fortunate enough to be backed by a team of very not motivated and dedicated colleagues of Baba Gulam Shah Badsha University who know their job and are result oriented. In this context, I would like to appreciate the efforts of the organizing committee of the Department of English, Baba Gulam Shah Badsha University, especially the head of the department, English, Dr. Pumina Rashid, organizing secretary, Dr. Maria Aslam, and Dr. Tanvir Ali, Dr. Tanvir Ahmed, for making this happen in these difficult times. Thank you very much, all of you. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Professor G.M. Malik. We were listening to Professor G.M. Malik, Dean, School of Languages and Islamic Studies, Baba Gulam Shabacha University. Uh, I know that there are many participants who may have a lot of questions, but we do not have that space here in this session. Uh, for next two days, tomorrow and day after tomorrow, we will have detailed sessions on William Shakespeare and all the questions and queries would be addressed. Uh, on this note, I would like to thank all the participants who joined us on Zoom, including Honorable Vice Chancellor, Professor Paul Budra from uh, Canada, uh, Dean Academic Affairs, GM Malik sir, and uh, the participants who jo joined us live on YouTube. Thank you all for making this session successful and being with us for more than an hour. And at this note, I'd like to end this meeting. Thank you, one and all.